Black Swan events are impactful and unpredictable. The Amplify Black Swan Growth and Treasury Core ETF, SWAN, was designed to protect against them. Let's dive into it. What is a black swan event? The term black swan is used to describe an extremely rare, inherently unpredictable event that has severe negative consequences. It has also been noted that hindsight bias is unusually common with black swan events, with people later claiming the event should have been obvious at the time. Notable examples of black swan events include Black Monday in 1987, the Asian financial crisis of 1997, the dot-com bubble of 2000, so on and so forth. Future black swan events could include things like trade war, an inverted yield curve, economic recession, eurozone political issues, policy shift on technology companies, etc. The idea of black swans was proposed by famed professor, author, and former trader Nassim Taleb. He has written several popular books on the concept of black swans and human beliefs related to risk and the asymmetry thereof. Some black swans do not necessarily result in bear markets. The point is we can't predict how markets will react to them. Taleb asserts that because of the inherent unpredictability and significant impact of black swan events, investors and people in general should remember that they are possible and plan accordingly. So enter the Swan ETF from Amplify. The Black Swan ETF from Amplify was designed to do just that, protect against these unpredictable adverse events. Appropriately, its ticker is SWAN or SWAN. The fund which launched in 2018 is designed to be a relatively safe, conservative investment vehicle that is still able to capture some upside while being more concerned with protecting the downside. Roughly 90% of the fund is invested in intermediate U.S. Treasury bonds, with the other 10% in long-dated call options, or LEAPs, on the S&P 500, and specifically the SPY ETF, that targets 70% participation, i.e. an option delta of 70. In this sense, the fund's target notional exposure can be described as 70-90 stocks bonds. The fund's proprietary index is the S-Network Black Swan Core Total Return Index, which is rebalanced and reconstituted on a semi-annual basis. Just like NTSX, the classic 60-40 portfolio, and the famous hedge fundy adventure strategy, Swan relies on the uncorrelation between stocks and treasury bonds, which tends to be conveniently amplified during periods of market turmoil. As treasury bonds tend to be the best diversifier, i.e. the lowest correlation, for stocks. This diversification takes advantage of the flight to safety behavior that typically causes investors to rush into treasury bonds when the stock market is crashing. Interestingly, unlike other defensive funds that use active management to attempt unsuccessfully to time the market, Swan doesn't change its asset allocation and doesn't limit upside gains in order to provide its defense. We would expect it to lag the market in bull markets, but it is still able to participate in them. An intrinsic feature of Swan's in-the-money leaps on SPY is that its call option exposure grows as the stock market rises and shrinks as the market falls. This means the fund participates increasingly more in stock market gains in bull markets and gets more protective as the market drops. That said, the fund still rebalances twice per year. Now let's talk about Swan versus NTSX. This fund reminds me of and is similar to NTSX from which Wisdom Tree. But whereas NTSX is built for stock market participation with a secondary goal of downside protection, Swan was sort of built for the opposite. Downside protection and volatility minimization as the primary goal with market participation and specifically above inflation returns being secondary. Also keep in mind that Wisdom Tree's stated use case for NTSX is to use it to make room for other assets. That said, these funds are pretty similar. In terms of exposure, NTSX is 1.5 times 60-40 for effective 9060 and Swan is roughly 1.6 times 4456 for effective 7090. Note that NTSX's Treasury Bond Futures Ladder has an effective average duration of about 7 years, while Swan's Treasury Bond Ladder aims to match the duration of the US 10-year Treasury note. Also note that Swan is slightly less tax efficient than NTSX, as Swan is holding 90% Treasury Bonds and 10% call options, while NTSX is holding 90% straight stocks and 10% treasury futures. Both funds are suitable for use as the core of the portfolio. Now let's talk about SWAN versus DRSK or D-RISK. 
from Aptus. This fund launched around the same time as Swan and is similar in terms of allocations, but different in terms of actual holdings. My guess is they got wind of the existing Black Swan Index and basically copied it, but also tried to differentiate just so they don't look exactly the same. But this might be totally false. Unlike Swan, DRSK is very much actively managed, like actual active management. The fund invests 75 to 95%, which is a pretty vague wide range, if you ask me, of assets in a bond ladder with an effective intermediate duration, not unlike Swan. But for some weird reason, DRSK uses entirely corporate bonds. We know treasury bonds should probably be preferable in diversified portfolios, especially in this context of mitigating volatility and risk. The fund then takes about 5% of assets and buys call options on stocks. Again, not unlike Swan. But here, DRSK buys call options on a handful of 10 to 20 individual stocks and sectors, and purposefully avoids indexes for this piece. This seems pretty silly to me, considering we know the data indicates that stock picking tends not to work. In their words, a basket of options is greater than an option on a basket. I disagree. Then the fund takes 1% of assets and buys an undisclosed market hedge, which seems to change. This sounds like it it would be something like gold, right? I think that'd be useful, but nope. Most recently, this allocation went to put options on the NASDAQ 100 index and the S&P 500 index. So we're simultaneously betting on the growth of a handful of individual stock picks and betting against the broader market. Seems weird to me. In their brief history, Swan has outperformed DRSK. And of course, all this comes with a higher fee of 78 basis points for DRSK. No thanks. Now let's talk about the historical performance of the SWAN ETF. SWAN has definitely delivered on its promise in its relatively short lifespan thus far. When the market fell roughly 17% in the Q4 2018 correction, SWAN fell only about 4%. When the market dropped by 30% in the crash in March 2020, SWAN dropped by 8%. Here's a backtest going back to SWAN's inception in December 2018 through June 2021. As we'd expect, SWAN has lagged the market in terms of total return, but has delivered a much higher risk-adjusted return. Notice its volatility is less than half that of the S&P 500, and its max drawdown during this time period was a quarter that of the market. We can go a little further back to 2006 using Swan's index data directly from their website. Here's the historical performance versus the S&P 500. Here are the annual returns for that. Here are the volatility and risk-adjusted return, measured by standard deviation and sharp, respectively, over that time period. Here's another stat illustrating Swan doing its job. Looking at the global financial crisis of 2008, the S&P 500's peak to trough drawdown was 55%. Swan's index was less than a quarter of that at a mere 13%. While we can't backtest options, we can get a very rough idea of how Swan might have behaved prior to the inception of its index using its target notional exposure of 70-90 using the S&P 500 and 10-year treasury bonds. Again, this is a very rough approximation and the fund itself would have certainly looked different due to the aforementioned dynamic nature of the allocation from the 70 delta options. I've compared it to another rough approximation of NTSX and the S&P 500 here going back to 1991, during which period these funds would have provided returns above that of the market with lower volatility and risk. Keep in mind this period was a great time for bonds, which helped result in the market outperformance. Moreover, since both Swan's exposure to bonds and its bond duration are considered greater than that of NTSX, this also would have allowed for Swan's comparatively greater performance over this time period. The future may and likely will look different. So we know Swan is for de-risking the portfolio and for protecting against black swan events. Let's briefly talk about a way to do that further. As I've noted elsewhere, I'm not a big fan of gold, but there are a couple things it does do. It reduces portfolio volatility and risk due to its usual uncorrelation to both stocks and bonds and it seems to hedge against uncertainty. A perfect descriptor of a black swan event is uncertainty. And since the swan investor is likely more concerned with the portfolio's volatility and risk than with maximizing its returns, I'd argue this is one of those instances where the addition of gold may make sense. Let's look at a rough idea of how this might have played out historically for swan if we set it at 80% and add 20% gold, again from 1991 through June 2021. Notice how we would have sacrificed a bit of Kager for 
slightly lower volatility and arguably more importantly, a slightly smaller max drawdown. Admittedly, the results don't look super impressive, but I'd argue this will likely be a more prudent move for the future given the current historically low yields of bonds, as bonds may not provide the same level of protection or returns in the future that we've seen in the recent past. So as usual, it comes down to how far you want to slide on that scale of risk and expected return. I've created that 80-20 swan gold pie for M1 Finance that I'll provide a link to in the description for anyone interested. In my opinion, swan looks extremely attractive for a risk-averse investor looking to minimize volatility and protect against drawdowns, but still get some market participation so as to not miss out on any potential upside. It is also appropriate for those at or nearing retirement for whom market crashes are more detrimental. This fund focuses on minimizing volatility and drawdowns drawdowns and navigating them unscathed, which it has demonstrated it can do quite effectively. Adding a dash of gold may improve that effort even more going forward. Swan provides what I'm a fan of, leveraged exposure to uncorrelated assets. Funds like Swan make it more likely that the investor will stick with their strategy and stay the course through market turmoil and I'm always trying to encourage that. Swan's fee of 0.49% is obviously high compared to simple broad index funds from Vanguard like VTI, for example, but it's actually on par with others for this type of options rolling strategy. You can choose to buy these same assets and roll the leaps yourself or pay 49 basis points for the convenience of having someone else do it for you. I still wish Swan were a bit cheaper considering NTSX is less than half the price at only 20 basis points, but you're paying for a slightly more complicated strategy. You can arguably get cheaper swan-like exposure by just buying NTSX plus some extra longer duration treasury bonds. In January 2021, Amplify launched an international version for which the ticker is ISWN or ISWAN, which may be a good addition for diversification considering swan only uses US stocks. However, it's only amassed about $40 million so far. What do you think of swan? Let me know in the comments. Thanks for watching. Some of the links below are referral links at no additional cost to you. If you choose to make a purchase or sign up for a service after clicking through those links, I may receive a small commission. This allows me to continue producing high quality content on this channel and pays for the occasional cup of coffee. I have firsthand experience with every product or service I recommend and I recommend them because I genuinely believe they are useful.